So, uh, hi, we'll jump right in. That's okay, I'm just a couple minutes behind, but uh, thanks for coming. My name is Chef. You can also call me Damon, which is what my mom calls me still. Um, but <clears throat> if you've seen me talk before, uh, good to see you again. Um, and so this is, uh, we're gonna explore what we wanna be when we grow up. So let's jump into it. <clears throat> oh, special thanks, first of all, uh, obviously to ShellCon and everyone that's putting this on. I know from uh, uh, volunteering at other conferences how much work goes into putting this together. Uh, so thank you for all for the work that you've done. Uh, NCC Group, my employer, I have the best job, I think, in the world because this is part of my job. This is in the job description. I get to advocate for security practitioners and give back uh, to our community. So thank you uh, for NCC Group. And of course, my wife and editor, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she goes through all my decks, takes out the corny dad jokes, and then I put them back in. And then when she sees the recording, <laughs> she says, I told you to take that joke out. And I didn't. Uh, and, but lastly, uh, you. So if ever you've done public speaking before, it's always horrifying because you, you put a deck together and you think, man, is anyone going to show up? And if they do, are they going to be interested in anything I have to say? So you have shown up. And I'm very grateful for that, uh, so thank you. Um, just quickly, this will be really short. Uh, again, this is a part of my job, so a quick commercial about my employer, NCC Group. It's a security consultancy that I work for. We're based in the United Kingdom, but we have eight offices uh, in North America, including Canada. And um, so come check out our booth. We're a sponsor this year as well, and uh, we, we love talking about ourselves, so that's NCC Group. Um, oh, you know, security consultancy. We're short on time, so let's, uh, let's talk about me for a minute. Uh, just to give you an idea of who I am, uh, I'm technical director for NCC Group North America. Uh, I've been in IT since 1995 and started specializing in InfoSec in 2001. Uh, that's when the dot-com bubble burst, so that was a really good time to uh, kind of change gears. Um, I studied music at uh, uh, Louisiana State. Probably not a whole lot of Tiger fans in here in California, but... <laughs> Uh, go Tigers. And then I went to grad school in 2005, uh, got a Master of Science in Information Assurance. So uh, that context will be important in a minute. Uh, currently, uh, or the first half of my career, I did a lot of blue team infosex on the defensive side uh, in Houston, Texas, where I've lived uh, that whole time. Uh, healthcare is really big. Oil and gas is really big. Um, but I've also done a little bit of DOD work and uh, aerospace at Johnson Space Center. So now you know about me. Here's what we're going to talk about. I have several goals that hopefully you will find useful. Um, we're going to talk about InfoSec. Um, uh, I'm going to tell my story a little bit, and then we're going to talk about some of my friends and colleagues, the case studies that I've put together. And these are people that I've worked with and have a great deal of respect for. And kind of the goal here is, as, as an industry, how did we get here? Where are we going? And how will we get to that eventual uh, uh, destination. So goals. Those are some goals. Thank you. Yeah, see, that's one of the jokes she said I should take out. <laughs> um, so the goals are, this is not me standing up here saying I've been in industry for 23 years and you should listen to me because I have a gray beard. This is about talking, if you read my abstract, there's lots of points of entry into various industries and predictors of success, but there's not very well-defined points of entry and predictors of success for information security. And I started, uh, you know, several years ago thinking about, you know, how have my friends and colleagues gotten into this industry and have they take, taken a similarly unusual path? And, and as it turns out, they have. So that's kind of the goal of this is for us to kind of help each other realize that, um, there is. <laughs> uh, all right, so that one worked. Uh, I learned these things the hard way. A lot of the lessons I'm going to share with you, I, I was a very successful systems administrator because I had learned every possible way to screw up a Windows server that exists, and then I had to fix it. Um, so, you know, let me be your warning <laughs> as I go through some of this stuff. So let's start talking about our industry, first of all, the history of information security. Um, if you've been in the industry long enough, InfoSec was kind of ancillary to whatever your day job was, right? There was no formal information security team. Or if there was, it might have been focused on access and authorization, for example. Um, 
updating software was primitive, especially in the Windows world, you would patch a server when you built it, and then you would patch it again when you rebuilt it three years later. Uh, there was no Windows update. Um, you had to download each patch individually, and who's got time for that? So as I will tell you, as a systems person, I never patched my boxes back in the 90s. Um, so when did our industry start? As we understand it today, I mean, there's been people that have been working in security for a long time. So I started looking at some interesting dates. I selfishly put MCC Group first. We were founded in 1999. <clears throat> Excuse me. We came out of the Ministry of Defense in the United Kingdom, but became uh, a private company in 99. Um, DEF CON started in 1993. Uh, any of you that used to be scanner junkies like me, you remember when the, the scanner Satan came out? Does anyone remember that one? Um, that was in 95. And then the kind of commercial version of that uh, was Saint uh, in 1998. And by the way, I always thought the folks that wrote Satan, they were clearly not marketing people, right? Because that's not probably a good acronym to name here, you know, not a good affiliation to have with your software product. Uh, IO Active, who's also a sponsor here, was uh, founded in 1998. White Hat, Metasploit, Lares, Trusted Sec, uh, all of those firms were in the, in the 2000s. So in my mind, I think of our industry as it exists today is basically being a couple of decades old. And that's up for debate. Some people say, no, it's been around a lot longer than that. But for, in my mind, I think of us as an industry as being, you know, in our 20s. So we're kind of, you know, we're young adults as, as, uh, as an industry. Um, so with that having been said, let me keep an eye on the time there. Okay. The history of Damon, I already showed this is an older version of my slide deck. You can see the beard is much shorter uh, back then. Um, so I started you know studying music and as it turns out there's a lot of really good drummers out there in the world and and you know one percent of the people make 99 percent of the money and that wasn't really consistent with the lifestyle i wanted and so i became a computer nerd quite by accident i worked in the lsu recording studio and thought the technology with the digital editing was more interesting than the things that i was recording so I found the technology more interesting. And as I learned more and more about managing systems, I fell into a job systems administrator <clears throat> um, when, you know, the dot com thing was still uh, fast and furious. Um, so I very much kind of got my start by accident. And I kind of carried that guilt around for a long time thinking now, I'm not a real InfoSec pro. You know, I wanted to be a drummer and I, this is just what, I, I, you know, I, I can do. And um, and I, I mentioned the music thing. I'll call that out. Do you remember? So I studied music. Do you remember this incident? I felt so bad for her because every Twitter went crazy and said she's got music degrees. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I have a music degree. So obviously, I, you know, and fortunately, uh, Twitter came back to its senses and people said, wait a minute, it has nothing to do with the CISO. There were systemic problems in this organization and her education had nothing to do with that. Uh, and I still believe that to be true. And we'll talk more about that uh, later. So my path into this industry was, you know, I was in music, I got a job at the recording studio, and then I got into high tech. Um, so I kind of, the path was I had some experience that I got and then I started doing formal training after I already had the job. And then I mentioned I went back to school uh, in the 2000s and, and uh, got a master's degree um, when my son was a newborn, by the way. Don't, that's the worst time to go to grad school. Um, but um, so speaking of those things, education, training, and experience, um, no, I apologize. That's a little dark up there, isn't it? So I made this Venn diagram because every slide deck has to have a Venn diagram. And I'm not, so I believe that education, training, and experience are the three big blocks that we need to have in some combination. And I'm not in love with the text uh, that where, where it overlaps. These could be representative. Um, and I think if you know, you're focused on training and education, maybe you're going to work in, a, in an academic sort of uh, um, career. If you're heavy on education and experience, you might be a really good generalist and that's not a bad thing i mean we you know being a generalist is good um 
And if you're heavy on experience and training, maybe you're some sort of specialist, subject matter expert. And in the middle of all that, I suggest that, you know, to be a well-rounded professional, you have to have some amount of all of these things. But I'm not going to say that you have to have all of those things. So I don't want to get hate mail people saying, oh, well, I don't have a degree. So you're telling me I can't be a well-rounded professional. Absolutely not true. Um, but just again, in terms of framing the conversation, when I talk about education, experience and training, the, the, this is the picture I see in my head. If you disagree, that, that's awesome. T tell me about it because I want to be smarter when I'm done with this uh, as well. Uh, so experience, Let, let's uh, talk about that for a minute. Well, what is experience? Well, if you've seen this movie, experience is not doing the same thing every single day for a really, really long time. Experience needs to be an iterative process where you're doing different things over a period of time. So if you find yourself in a in somewhat of a rut professionally where you feel like you're in Groundhog Day, um, keep an eye on that because eventually you could get pigeonholed into you know a role that you can't get out of. So if I'm giving advice to people, I'd say, you know, I'm not saying you have to change jobs every year, but always be cognizant of the fact that you, you make sure you're not living in Groundhog Day. Um, and that will include leaving your comfort zone uh, and making sure you have a good support network, including uh, mentors. And just a quick word about mentors. I've had, I can't count the number of people that have helped me in my career when they didn't have to. Um, and a mentor doesn't have to be someone that's older than you are. I have two guys that I worked with uh, several years ago, and I'm still friends with them both that are closer to my teenager son's age than they are to mine. But they had experience and skills that I didn't have. And so even though they were younger, they had something to offer to me. So I think we all agree you have to have mentors, but don't limit yourself. You can get great mentorship from unexpected places sometimes. Um, so that's that. All right, training. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, all these QR codes, I promise they're not malicious links. I just wanted to give credit to all the photos I stole off of Google. So this is from someone's blog, uh, Chris Ng, who uh, loves to talk about the fact that he's not a CISSP. Uh, I am, uh, but uh, you know, see, training can solve, it is one predictor of success of many. So don't immediately dismiss uh, training if it involves a certification. When you get to the case studies part, uh, I'll talk about the different people uh, that I know who have, have who place different values on on uh, on training specifically, uh, and uh, education, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, it is also important, but like I said, my first degree was in music, so you know, did my music degree help me get that first systems job? Probably not, although my first boss was also a percussionist, coincidentally, so maybe that did help out. Um, but I didn't, you know, finish the music degree because I, I knew it was going to, you know, further my high tech career. Um, I think I'm a big believer in education for education's sake. And here's my example. Uh, if you live in Houston, you are automatically a fan of um, Johnson Space Center and the space program. And if you're not, then they politely ask you to move to Oklahoma. Um, Story Musgrave is my favorite astronaut because he is a big believer in education for education's sake. So he's the guy that put the glasses on the Hubble Space Telescope. So he did the extra vehicular activity where they fixed the Hubble. And when you're training for a mission, it can take years and years and years and years. So Story, living down south of Houston near University of Houston Clear Lake, would collect degrees. He's got seven degrees. He is a flight surgeon, so he's a medical doctor. But he also uh, has degrees in aerospace, in literature, and I can't remember the others. Uh, his, oh, oh, it was already there. There it is. Okay. Uh, there's a really interesting wiki uh, article about him posted there. It lists all of his degrees. Um, but, you know, does, does his literature degree help him be a better astronaut? Well, probably not. Maybe when he's doing those EVAs and he gets bored, he can go through, you know, his catalog of you know, stories he's read or whatever. Um, but he just enjoyed education. So if you don't have a degree, 
it's not going to mean that you're not you can't be successful but at the same time if you want education just because learning can be fun then that's okay too um and so i think of story musgrave when i think of you know when people ask me oh do you regret having you know gotten the music degree well no of course not i mean I, my career didn't go the way i thought it was going to um <clears throat> but that that's how life works sometimes so the case studies here, um, this is a consultant that was very early in his career. He kind of went a traditional route and got a four year degree, uh, deciding he decided that hacking was cool when he was still an undergrad. Um, but he assumed that the only way to get into Infosec was by going through IT. Uh, and, he, it, and he didn't want to be a developer. So he thought, well, if I'm going to get into hacking, I first have to go into IT. By the time he graduated in 2014, uh, Infosec um, jobs were becoming more and more common and bypassing IT and going straight into InfoSec by that point was not surprising like it once was. Everybody that's of my age or similar, we all came through the systems world just because that's how the world worked at, at the time. He had some interesting quotes when I was interviewing him. He said he wished he had done defense first. And as a former blue team guy, I was thrilled to hear this because I tell my clients, you know, I work for a consultancy, Defense is harder than offense, full stop. And it always will be, I bring in the team of red teamers, we hack all the things, we drop off the link to report, give you the invoice and then push out of it. Meanwhile, you've got to fix all the problems and also keep defending your organization day in and day out. It's a lot easier uh, <clears throat> to be offensive, and I don't mean offensive, but I mean on offense uh, than it is defense. And to hear him say that, uh, I, I think that's true. Um, he, fought, he says he gets better at application assessments by actually building software. So even though he said that he didn't want to be a developer, as he became an information pro, security pro, he started building software and that made him better at breaking software. Uh, and he kind of had a cynical view uh, on training. You know, I talked about training and, and all that. He thinks experience is the most useful thing. And I'm not saying he's wrong, but, you know, every time he would take a class, he said he gets more turned off on training. I think you know, that, that might speak to the organization from <laughs> more than the concept of training. Um, but that was uh, his point of view. So he, he took kind of a traditional route. Um, here's something that's kind of mid-career of business owner that owns his own business. He also started off uh, with a four-year degree, but he pushed and he and I worked together early in our careers, actually. Uh, he went straight into IT just like I did on the undergrad. And at that time in 1989, there was no clear path to become a systems administrator, especially with an English and economics degree, right? So how do you get into systems? Um, you know, like I said, I got into it just because I figured out that everybody was writing Windows jobs. Um, graduate school is what got him into management positions, and that management experience is what got him to start his own information security. A uh, notable quote from him if the uh, dot-com bus hadn't happened, he wouldn't have gone to business school. So there was a lot of people that left IT altogether. The rest of us that chose to stay had to kind of reinvent ourselves. Um, so a lot of what is happening now, I'm saying, is a result of, of that fiasco back then. Um, he still says his English degree is a great degree, it, it, especially if you're consulting, you're doing a lot of communication with the written work. And as it turns out, writing in a clear, concise manner is, is hard. Um, creative people tend to excel in InfoSec. I, I agree with them completely. Every security company I've worked for has enough musicians in it to start a band or two. Um, we're, we're creative folks. Um, and with regard to training, he, he made it a point to say there's a difference between um, credential training and applied training. So. His security firm does a lot of uh, PCI compliant, um, compliance sorts of um, uh, testing. So having that credential with CISSP is actually very important to him because many of his clients want to see that there's some formal credential in the past. Uh, so they solve two different problems. Uh, you know, taking training to get some letters out of your name is not a bad thing. <laughs> Just understand that they're solving two different problems. Uh, Because I'm running short on time, I need to skip a couple of these. Oh, okay. No, 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 this is, uh, I know this guy. Uh, he, he 
he chose a stupid British accent with his British accent. So with the, he chose the same route I did. He started the music, and when I was on the phone with him, he's like, "Yeah, I can have that." Like, I mean, why was it stupid? It's the same way I got into it. Uh, he studied sound engineering and moved on to networking, and uh, he had an apprenticeship in microwave communication when he was still living in the UK. And somehow he made the leap from satellite engineering uh, to to infosec. So he had some really thoughtful things to say. Well, I don't think training is a good substitute for throwing yourself into Event, those are the moments I've grown the most. And I think that's true, especially even if you're not a consultant. I mean, every day when you go to work, you can like to think, I know exactly what's going to happen today and exactly what I'm going to do. And it rarely works out that way. Every day, whether you're a consultant or you're a security operator, whatever your job is, something's going to happen that you can't anticipate. That's just the way it is. And rather than being frustrated by it, and it is frustrating, you know, realize those are the opportunities you need to grow. Imposter syndrome. I wish I had more time to die. There's another talk later today that's talking about imposter syndrome, and I hope I get to see. It inspires you to improve. Even the expert can be taught. We have much opportunity to learn. Um, I, the, the, some of the smartest people I know are some of the people that say, oh, I don't know the most. Because you can't know everything, but don't be insecure about it. Just realize that none of us are going to know everything there is to know in the this industry. Uh, adaptability is the most important part of knowing your limits, but don't be afraid to push them. And I think that's pretty safe advice. So, has anyone not heard the term imposter syndrome? Is that new? Uh, yeah. So, if you ever see this picture, I love this picture of it, and that's where I stole it from. <clears throat> this is the perfect example of what imposter syndrome feels like, at least for me. It feels like you're surrounded by a bunch of people in the industry that know everything. It's like, I've got this little bucket of expertise, and everybody else knows everything else. But the reality of it is we all have the same bucket. It's just distributed around the industry. And if you spend enough time talking to people and realizing what you know and what other people know, we all know a little bit. And we're experts in a small, a small number of things, and so, I don't know, imposter syndrome is a very real thing, I can tell you, as a 23-year veteran of this industry, I still wonder someday. Yeah, you know, I was telling a story earlier, um, any moment, they're going to realize I'm, I'm, I'm a friend, I'm a fraud, and I'm going to lose my job, and it's been 23 years. We all go through it. This is a difficult industry, and it's hard, even even if you're only marginally successful on any given day, um, it is very difficult. So we'll start wrapping up here. Uh, this is not a, an IT person. This is, a, this is a gentleman that was a company clerk in the Army during Vietnam. He got into consulting and he, he ended up running the largest helicopter operator, I think, at the time in the world. Uh, and hundreds of bases and 500 helicopters they, they operate globally. And, um, the trick question here is what type of rotorcraft did you fly? And the reason it's a trick question is because he's a businessman. He doesn't fly at all. He said, I can't fix helicopters and I can't fly them, but the goal of any business is to be profitable. So the degree got his foot in the door. Consulting exposed him to oil and gas, and that gave him the experience to know how to run a helicopter company, even though he himself could not fly them. So, you don't have to be a pilot to run an airline, but you have to surround yourself by people who understand those things. So I got into management a number of years ago, and I can't keep up with the consultants who know more than I do. Um, but I'm able to help lead and run a business um, because I make sure that I surround myself by people that know more stuff than I do. So I can focus on you know, doing the business resources things, and then I have smart people around me that are actually doing the work that I've been talking about. Um, so sometimes it's better to not be a subject matter expert to run a company because you tend to fall in love with technology. So if you find yourself going down a path of getting into a leadership role or management, just know that your technical skills might start to atrophy, but that's okay. That's a natural part of growth as you get into business, and you need to be bringing in fresh talent in your organization anyway. And speaking of failure, Um, Thomas Edison failed 10,000 times, um, uh, but he doesn't, he doesn't consider them failures. He succeeded in proving those 10,000 ways will not work. And so there's going to be failures along the way. There's going to be things that aren't going to work 
um, the way we think they are, but that's okay. Don't think of them as failures, just think of them as, as a, I'm sorry, I put you wrong, right? uh, learning opportunities. And the last story I'll share with you, because <clears throat> I know I'm going over here, is uh, check out this, this story. I'm not going to read it to you, but uh, basically the gentleman who wrote it says that <clears throat> being a chauffeur once upon a time was the best job to have because automobiles were expensive, they were difficult to maintain, and so if you were a chauffeur, you were in a very much a position of power. You got to drive somebody else's expensive vehicle and maintain it, and the household you worked for was completely dependent upon you to get them around. As the technology advanced and automobiles became cheaper and easier to operate, now being a chauffeur is not the powerful and envy uh, position it once was. So the lesson for us, oh, and the best quote is here, uh, knowledge is power all right, but it's temporary power for knowledge flows. What one person knows, another can also know. In the 90s, uh, before the dot-com thing happened, it was very easy for systems people to become very, very arrogant because we ran the data center. Yo, business, without us, you don't exist. And that arrogance bit us on the backside uh, when all those businesses went away. So prepare, we need to prepare ourselves. InfoSec is not always going to be like it is today. It is going to change, and we need to stay ahead of that curve and make sure we're still valuable uh, to our organizations when that change happens. Um, so set goals for yourself. <laughs> um, as you're setting goals for yourself, though, be patient. Uh, the speed of business is not the same as the speed of life. Uh, sometimes businesses take a long time to affect change. Um, and be self-aware. I, I went through kind of a professional purgatory at, at some point in my career, and I went from job to job to job, and they were all terrible. And I thought, man, how talk about having bad luck. I kept having these, picking these bad employers. What are the chances? of that happening, and then one day it hit me like a ton of bricks. The only thing that those positions had in common was me. And I'm like, oh, well maybe that was what was wrong, and sure enough, I had some behaviors that were not conducive to a successful career, and, and that that's that was not fun figuring that out, but I had to be self-aware and realize that I was creating a lot of my own problems. So, concluding remarks, this moral of all of this story, there's no right way to get in this industry, there's no wrong way, how InfoSec is applied in business has got to continue to change and be codified, so we need to be prepared for that. Um, it's not going to be the Wild West kind of like it is today forever. Um, so we have to adapt. Uh, success now and over time requires that regular uh, reevaluation. And um, as I told the colleague of mine once, it's not going to be uh, you know a party every single day. That's why they call it work and they give us money to do it. Um, so that's. Um, Ruin my story. I, I have a story about the bus, but I don't have time, so if you catch me afterwards, I'm happy to tell you the bus story. I think it's relevant, but I'll close for now. Comments or questions? I've explained everything. <laughs> Thank you.